All right, here we are, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us, those of you that are out there, and for those of you coming. My name is Ivy, and on behalf of Right Pack Credit Union and Financial Health Matters Day, we are excited. We're getting ready to host our first live stream talking about money and talking about the financial health of Americans and what we can all do to be better. As I mentioned, my name is Ivy. I am a community development specialist for the credit union and a certified financial counselor. And most importantly, I'm really excited when it comes to being able to talk to people about managing their personal finances and living the lives you want to live. And so I'm excited and we're excited about all of the opportunity nationally that Financial Health Matters Day brings to bring attention around the importance of managing our money, thinking about our money and being better with our money. So today, over the next hour, we're gonna be streaming, answering a lot of the commonly held questions that we see as a credit union when we're in seminars and events and emails that we get from our members. But we're also gonna be answering your questions that you send in. So on that note, please make sure to chime in, share, 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 ask questions, and we'll do our best to get those questions answered for you in the next hour or so. As always, if there's anything that we can't answer while we're here live, we'll work with you outside of the um, stream to be able to answer those questions for you. So my colleague here, Adam, he's actually gonna be shooting some of the commonly questions, help ask questions that we have over to me, and I'm gonna do my best to answer them for you. And as I said, please feel free to chime in, ask your specific questions, and share, 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 share. It's really important that we're getting the word out about being financially well, living the lives we want, and meeting our goals. So Adam, What's the first question that we might have today? <laughs> Thanks, Ivy. That, that, that's awesome. And I'm safely on this side of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, w w why don't we go ahead and start with, like, w what does financial health even, even mean? What does it mean to be financially healthy? Sure. So you know what, Adam? Sadly, 57% of Americans we found um, in, a, in a survey that was done with our partner, Center for Financial Solutions Innovation, they're actually one of the key organizations that's having this conversation around financial health today. And they found that over half of Americans, 57%, mm -hmm. were considered unhealthy. And when we look at unhealthy, it really is a matter of not able to focus, you know, not focusing on what really counts, how we spend, how we save, how we borrow and how we plan, and really having a balance between all of them. So at the end of the day, when you're financially healthy, it means you have a balance between how you spend, how you save, how you borrow, and how you plan. And really... At the credit union, you know, we have resources that focus on all of that, but we're really focusing in on what the spend area looks like. Because at, at, at the heart of it, if we can get our spending and manage our spending well, then we can save better. We can manage how much we borrow and maybe not yeah. over borrow. We can not only think about how we're taking care of the day-to-day -day needs we have, but we can also plan for tomorrow. And so financial health is about all of those things working together to help us meet our goals, live the lives we want, um, and then at the end of the day, it's about when the storms come, we're able to weather those storms because we have the resources to do it. And then when opportunities come, we can also take advantage of those opportunities as well. You know, we have the balance between both sides of bad times and good times. And so mm -hmm. that's what financial health is all about. Um, and like I said, sadly, as Americans, we've seen some numbers that say we're not there, but it doesn't mean we can't get there, right? So if I'm part of that 50% that's not there, what can I do? So there's a couple things you can do. The first thing you're doing it now, if you're on the stream, right? You're having a conversation about it. Paying attention to your finances is the first step. Um, getting a clear picture of where you are. I always like to talk about the GPS analogy when I'm teaching classes. So what's the GPS analogy? You know, just like a GPS, you have to figure out where you are before you ever can get where you wanna head. And so the first step to really improving your financial health is to get a clear picture of where your health financially is anyway. What do your finances look like? Do you have money saved? Are you budget budgeting and managing your day-to-day -day spending well? Do you have a plan for tomorrow? Do you think you have an adequate insurance when it comes to you know insuring you and your family and making sure they're covered in the case of an emergency or a need? You know, do you have peace of mind there? Are you planning for retirement? Um, and so it's taking that first look to make sure you have a clear picture of what your finances look like and then also taking a second look at what you want them to look like, right? Because what's important to me may not be important mm. to you. Um, we always talk about it, right, Pat? Living the life you want to live. The life for our one member may be on a boat when they retire. The life for me may be to send all five of my children to college without any debt. It looks different for all of us, mm. but whatever it looks like, we have to establish that. So we figure out where we are, put that address in the roadmap, 
figure out where we want to be, put that address in the roadmap, and then we start to walk down the road to get there. So that's really kind of the steps to take at a high level. You know, there's all these bumps and, and, and mm-hmm. valleys along the way, but that's really what it's about, getting clear about where you are, where you want to be, and then setting some short, mid, long-term goals to help you slow step each, each step along the way. That makes a lot of sense, but if we're honest here, it's been a few years since I met any of my New Year's resolutions. I mean, uh, <laughs> but w- w- how do we actually set goals at work? You know what? It's so funny you said that. I was just having a conversation with a friend of mine about um, resolutions and how really resolutions sound great, but it's really goals. It's really having goals, actionable goals that get us there. Hmm. And the one thing I've learned about financial goals specifically is you have to back into them. Um, a lot of times we have a goal and maybe that goal is I want to buy a house well on the road to buying a house there's so many small goals you have to get take you know steps you have to take to even get to the goal being buying a house for example you want to look into your credit you want to save for the deposit you may have to improve your credit Um, you want to save for not only the uh, down payment but ongoing expenses those are each small steps that get us to the big goal. And whether it's buying a house or sending a child to college or retiring early or retiring on time, there are these small steps that we can take and we have to back into them. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that's important when you're thinking about setting goals, really backing into them, looking at what small goals will help you reach the big goal that you have. And sometimes you have to sit down and talk to somebody about it. Have that accountability partner, right? Um, have someone that you can ask questions of. We have that at the credit union, actually, where you can sit down and uh, walk through your budget, take a look at what goals you may have, and how you can attain them, and maybe what obstacles you have in front of you to obtaining those things. That's the other key piece, being honest about the obstacles. A lot of times we want the fluffy pie in the sky, but we're not really taking a look at the ingredients that we already have and what we're going to need to get there. So we have to slow step it and back into it. So if I'm really not sure how to get started, I can literally just come into a member center or yeah so you can come into a member center and we partner with an organization called green path and they have certified counselors that Mm. will meet with you one-on-one you can actually call in um the information we can share it at the end i guess um is that way okay that share that out but yeah you can call and schedule a one-on-one appointment you can talk to them over the phone but yeah many of our centers you can pop in also and talk to one of our coaches just share with them what are some of the goals are that you may want to achieve, and they can talk through some simple steps you might take te- to get started. Yeah, that's the one thing I love, like the resources from getting started to retirement. You know, you have those options out there. A lot of times it's just having a conversation with somebody. And then we also have seminars that, you know, you can kind of come in and just chat through it and learn a little bit more mm-hmm. about a certain topic. So, yeah. Okay. So let's say I get on that path, I'm getting started. I mean, what are some of those road bumps I have to look out for? What are, what are some of those common mistakes people are making with money? So, yeah. So, the first common mistake is never getting started. And, you know, it's really kind of about not, not starting to have an idea of what you want your finances to look like. You know, you have a job or you don't have a job. Or you're, you're just kind of going through day to day, but you're not managing it. So, that's the first common mistake that we see. Um, another common mistake we see people not uh, managing their spending. Like I said, we, we're really learning that, you know, while the country has huge lo- boatloads of debt, consumer debt, while the country has huge boatloads of um, debt and household debt as well, we're seeing spending as the big challenge. Because mm-hmm. if we can, like, again, yeah, I go back to if we can manage our spending, then we can increase our savings. If we can manage our spending, the likelihood of overborrowing is decreased. All these things. So, managing our spending well managing our spending in a way that takes a look at what we have to take care of first what we'd like to take care of next and what opportunities we want to be able to take advantage Mm. of going forward kind of balances that out so that's a common mistake um another common mistake overspending right still along those lines of overspending there's four areas we tend to overspend in we tend to overspend in food we tend to overspend in utilities still because we don't turn the light off when we leave the room we tend to overspend in entertainment, and we tend to overspend in late fees, hmm. which goes back to managing spending. I want to ask, I guess, you know, those that are listening, what are some of the things that you might tend to overspend in? Did, did, did anything that I just said, did you fall in any of those categories by chance of food, utilities, e- uh, eating out, and late fees? You know, because like I said, commonly we see that as a theme. So that that's a, a common mistake, overspending, overspending. Another uh, common mistake, not having a plan. You know, I was sitting here before we got started, and I said, Adam, can I have my 
planner out, just trying to stay on the plan, <laughs> trying to keep myself not only financially organized, but also keeping myself organized with my day. And I will tell you, I have five children. That is not an easy task. Some days just <laughs> sticking to the task list is is the feat, right? But we, But if we can plan both our time as well as our budgets, that's something that will help us. And so that's a common mistake. One other mistake I like to really talk about is affordability. Um, I think that we have lost the concept of what affordability really means. Mm. Affordability comes along in a couple ways. You know, my kids and I talk about affordability very simply. Can you pay for it twice? Yes or no. If you can't say yes, you can't afford it. And so we, we kind of say that jokingly sometimes, but they get it. You know, it was an easy way if we're out somewhere and they understand that the idea of affordability is when mm. you have money to take care of it today, you have money to take care of it until it's gone, if it's like a debt or something, and then you still have money to manage your day-to-day -day and save. If you can't do all four of those things, you have to question affordability. And I think the biggest mistake people take make a lot of times is they look at expenses um, individually and not collectively, mm. and so affordability is lost in that. You know what I mean? So they're yeah. looking at it like, oh, I can afford the payment from month to month. But what does it do for the big picture of how you're spending? And so that's the kind of thing we have to look at. I mean, I think one easy trap for me sometimes is like, oh, look, there's dollars in the account. <laughs> yes. The money's there. I can spend it. Right? <laughs> and so that goes to another common mistake, you know, not giving every dollar a name. Mm. Um, I believe in, you'll hear it sometimes called a zero-based budget or giving every dollar a name. I believe that every dollar you have coming in should be allocated to something. So yeah, a lot of times we pay our bills and it's like, oh, there's money left over. I have free money to do whatever I'd like with. But if we have an intention and you know, kind of plan our money on purpose, plan every paycheck, give every dollar a name, it'll help kind of get rid of that, oh, there's money in my account so I can spend it mentality. And I always tell people, plan your fun money too. You know, it's okay to have mm. fun money in your budget. I actually have a separate debit card that says fun money on the card because I know I'm going to spend money outside of just goals and business, but I separate it and I plan for it. You know? so you, you so, can do that with right Pet or right yeah. Pet has ways to help you kind of budget that? Yeah, you can actually, um, you know, open up like sub-checking accounts or sub-savings accounts that are secondary to your main accounts so you can physically separate your money. Um, and that's one really good way to help create a budget and create manage your spending in a way that you know you separate it you can create automatic transfers to it and that was something cool that I learned that I didn't even know we had until I got here that I could actually open up two checking accounts not just savings accounts but actual checking accounts where I can separate my bills and from my you know spending and free flexible money that I have so yeah you can do that Okay, that's, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, do you have any more tips for what I can do to make my spending better? Um, the one thing I, I think I kind of mentioned is overborrowing, being careful not to overborrow. Mm. So, of course, we're a lending institution. We know people get loans, and, you know, the idea is loans will help you uh, to meet, you know, needs that maybe you don't have, haven't been able to meet in a short time. You can pay it off over time. So loans can be valuable. Um, but a lot of times overborrowing occurs, and that's a mistake that people make either over borrowing because the lending has to happen as a result of an emergency um, because we didn't plan for an emergency and so we have to borrow to take care of the emergency sometimes over borrowing happens again going back to that affordability oh I'm approved at this amount so that's the amount that I should have and we don't necessarily think about the other expenses we want to be able to take care of while also saving um, and then also over borrowing because maybe we go out and shop for the item before we shop for the loan so it's a good idea to shop your loan, you know, work with your financial institution first, get your get your uh, pre-approvals and things like that before you go out and maybe your eyes become bigger than your pocketbook. Because then you may tend to over borrow, you know, look for opportunity to get more than maybe you were going to spend in the first place. So that's one that I always am careful of over borrowing and not having savings, not having an emergency fund. Mm. Um, we used to do the savings race years ago and... Uh, I remember one coach very vividly saying on, a, on an interview, she said, the one thing I've learned through this race is when you have an emergency pot, or what I like to call life happens pot, because life's going to happen, right? When you have that life happens pot, it's not such an emergency anymore um, mm -hmm. because it may not be expected, 
may not be planned for, but you have what you need to take care of it. And not having an emergency fund can lead to knocking your budget off, but also over borrowing when you have to borrow money that you didn't have in your in your account, you know, to take care of in the first place. So um, that's another one, over borrowing and then not having that emergency fund. It, it's all connected though I mean I, I know a lot of folks don't have an emergency fund and when you talk about it, it's like I mean I'm using everything just to get to tomorrow here yeah. I mean how do you even go about starting to build an emergency fund man that's a great question because it can be tough sometimes um, and a lot of times you hear out there you know you have to have three to six months of emergency money saved necessary expenses you have enough to cover three to six months you have to have it you have to have it that is the pie in the sky where you want to be Three to six months is a sweet spot to make sure if a storm comes, again, you can weather it without totally throwing off your family's well-being. But the main thing is, I think, to just get started and to start the habit of savings, um, start to have the habit of putting something away. It could be $2. It could be $5, you know, that you make consistent transactions. I always tell people with emergency savings and funds, the biggest thing that t- is our advantage is consistency and um, and well consistency is consistency 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 so even if it's a small amount it we've always seen in math that one plus one equals two so as long as we're putting it away um, in a savings account where it's safe and it can grow a little interest for you it's better than not doing it and so while we ideally want to get to that three to six months um, a starter fund of a thousand dollars or five hundred dollars if you make less than twenty six thousand dollars a year that at least says if something happens i don't have to rob Peter to pay Paul. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have to totally throw my budget off to take care of everything. I don't have to necessarily turn to credit to take care of it. Sadly, over half of Americans don't have $400 cash saved in an emergency. Not $400. I want to ask you guys, what would $400 take care of for you in the case of an emergency? That's just a question mm-hmm. for you to think about. You know, Because when we think about $400, that's not a huge amount. Um, but over half of Americans... In that same survey that was done a couple of years ago, CFSI shared that they wouldn't have it if they needed it. And that's scary. That's scary. $400 isn't even a copay in many cases, or deductible, I'm sorry, you know, for some insurance claims. That's a blown tire. So think about that, you know, if you had an emergency today, you know, are you taking small steps to put something away that would help you to take care of it? And like I said, it may not be $100 per pay period. It might just mm-hmm. be 5 but maybe five dollars is one trip to grab that coffee in a savings account instead. Five dollars mm-hmm. a week over time really can add up. You know, I I, I have a I think twenty dollars a month, um, twenty dollars a week. If someone does a five dollar coffee a day, twenty dollars a month, right? Or f- excuse me, twenty dollars mm-hmm. a week. Just you know, if you did during the work week, that's twenty dollars a week. That is eighty dollars a month. And if you multiply that throughout the year, there's your emergency fund. Hmm. So it's one coffee a day. You know, it's packing your own coffee, bring your own lunch. And, and, it's, and it seems, I'm not trying to water it down like that's, it's just that easy, but it could be just that easy if it's a matter of saving t- an extra $20 a week. Where do you find it? You find it in the small things, not the big things. It, it's definitely on the planning and the discipline where the magic happens. Uh, Michelle's chiming in saying one of the hardest things for her is just, you know, overspending on groceries, on eating out, I mean, coffee, that sort of thing. I mean, it's, you're in the moment, you, you grab what you want, and it, it, it's hard to build out that plan, but all these yeah. things add up. Yeah. Michelle, you know what's funny? Um, that was when I, when I started in this role and when I uh, really started to look at my finances a little differently, I, that was one area that almost made me quit my job <laughs> and wonder <laughs> if I was even qualified to have these conversations because I would overspend in the grocery store and actually when I before I worked here I worked near the downtown Dayton area and I think I was keeping some of the Brown Street lo- uh, restaurants open <laughs> because I would eat out every day um, and I started to set small goals for myself because I, I didn't think that I could just cut back like oh I'm just never gonna eat out so I started cutting down to like eating out twice a week and I'm down and I allow myself one one time a week to have lunch out because I know the way my schedule is, that's just realistic for me. But that was a big change for me. Um, I also started doing two things when it came to my groceries. I actually started for a long time only going in a grocery store with cash Mm -hmm. because I would go over my grocery budget on average $15 to $20 every time I would go in there. And it was funny because then I had to understand the psychology of it. The first few times I went in the grocery store with cash only, I still took my debit card 
just in case. <laughs> and then I realized that was counter, you know, productive. So I stopped bringing my debit card. And then I remember the day I went to the grocery store and I actually went to the counter and I had just overspent just a little bit and had to put money back or put a few grocery items back. And I remember the mindset of battling. The people around me are going to think that I don't have enough money to pay for this. There's a lot of emotions in there. There's this. so much emotion, right? So then I had to realize that piece of what was going on with me. And I didn't think that about myself. I was dealing with some status stuff. I knew I could afford it. But I had to get beyond the emotion of it to you've made a conscious choice to reach a certain goal. That means this, has to, this spending has to get tightened up. And so that was really a game changer for me. Um, and then I find I got beyond that and I would spend cash. Now, a lot of times, I actually order my groceries online. Mm. And some people say, well, doesn't that cost money to do it? It does. But what it allows me to do is take my time. I don't impulse shop because I buy what I need. I shop in order. I always buy what I need for meals, what I need for lunches, and then what I need for snacks. And then if there's money left for other stuff, then I will add it. But the nice thing is I can see the amount. The bottom line is as soon as I'm going to be charged it, the most I'm going to be charged I, you know, if I go over, I can take an item off right there and it's convenient for me too. But like it has helped me so much with my grocery budget and that whole mindset of being in the store, putting things back, it's gone now. But I had to get beyond the emotion of it. Like you said, Adam, it was really a moment where I thought about it. It wasn't about the money at all. It was really about the emotion behind and the control of what I wanted to be able to do. It was something, so... Yeah, that's that a, a great that's point, a really sure. good tip. I mean, I I never thought about shopping online, and I don't know if it's for me or not. Getting groceries online, it's kind of <laughs> kind of weird, but I, I definitely see how that can help a lot of people. I might, I might have to try that. It. But it is, you know, everything's different for everybody. There is a small fee to do it, but I will tell you, like, so I was going over my budget, fifteen to twenty dollars. The fee is like five dollars, but the five dollars to make sure I don't go over my budget, it kind of you know all comes out in the wash. But it's not for everybody. It's just worked for me in this time, and maybe in a couple of years I'll try something else. You know, I've never been a couponer. Mm. That's my, like, everyone's like, just use coupons. And I think that's the main tip out of this. You have to use the strategies that work for you, and you have to use the budget tool that works for you. Everything's mm. different for everyone, right? Some people are paper and shop online people. Some people are paper people, some people are online digital people. You have to really use what works for you, you know, because there's so much out there. Right, and yeah. I know part of that equation too, I mean, we're gonna have to talk about this eventually. What about credit? What about Ooh. loans? Yeah, credit, 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 credit. I have a stat I wanna uh, give you guys uh, speaking on credit. I saw this, I, was, I went and looked at the updated numbers. So consumer debt, you know, that's debt that we as consumers, me, we as people who spend money in the economy um, is considered consumer debt. It's extremely high. I actually looked up the number last night. We ended 2018. Household consumer debt was at $13.54 trillion. Ooh. Collectively, we, um, it says collectively, Americans owe 26% of their income to debt. So a quarter of your income goes to debt and spend 10% of their individual income on non-mortgage debt. So credit cards, car loans, uh, student loans, personal loans. So not even your home. We're talking about 10% of that is going to debt that's for really disposable items. Now, I mean, student loans, there is a difference between good debt and bad debt. And student mm -hmm. loans, home loans, business loans, those are considered better debt. But no debt's a good, good that you can't afford, right? And so we do. We have to have this conversation. So like you're saying, I'm sorry, good debt, oh, bad okay. debt, that's a little confusing for me too. So, like, So yeah. what's... You say like student loans. So you're saying like like you're investing in a sense in your future. So yeah, or? so yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. So and that's tough, right? That's very debatable. But there are some things if you looked at what's considered good debt, bad debt. Good debt is considered debt that helps you to potentially invest in something or something that in the long run could give you a return. Mm. So that's why things like student loans, in reason, could be considered good debt. Business loans because they're helping you to you know. Uh, build up your resources to do oh, so you're, you're literally return. meaning like a financial return then you know return yeah. on your education return ultimately on your right because there are still th st statistics that show that you know levels of education equal levels of income and so yes actual things that can potentially give you financial return when you borrow from them um but the challenge is you know student loan debt we know that's skyrocketing and reaching an all-time high um you know, so when we look at good debt and bad debt, yeah, the idea is that things that could give you a return, things that are going to give, you know, become asset at some point for you, not for the lender, but for you over time. And then bad debt being 
those debts that are really um, could be for disposable type things, um, debt that doesn't necessarily help you do anything. And when I say do anything, debt when managed will help you build your credit, but mm -hmm. do things tangible. Um, and then any debt that's not manageable or affordable is bad debt. I don't care what kind it is, right? And so there's that debate on is there truly a, a tr uh, is there truly good debt, bad debt? I always say bad debt, better debt. <laughs> you know, and like I said, any debt that you can't afford would be considered bad debt, whether it's a student loan, a home, or a credit card. Our our idea is we want you to not take on debt. I always say this: don't micro, don't use debt to microwave your goals. You want to use debt and credit as a way to enhance your financial outlook. So things mm. that will help you take care of things over time, things you can afford, um, things that will help you know that don't hinder your budget and make it where it's not manageable. That's that's decent debt. That's the kind of debt you want to take on. Debt you can pay off on time or early. And so um, that's important because payments on time and how much debt you have mm. versus how much you're using. That's the top two things that impact your credit score. I know credit scores are, I mean, really pretty mysterious to a lot of people. Yeah, let's talk about that a little. Credit scores are really mysterious, even though there are, every other minute there's a commercial about them, right? Do you know your score? Do you know your score? And it's because people are trying to have the conversation. So credit scores are really important um, because they do, they gauge how you manage your debt ultimately. Um, but they provide a formula-based um, some would say objective way of looking at how you manage your finances as a way to determine your risk when you're dealing with whatever organization you're going to get involved in. So credit is used to look at a couple of things, not only loans. We, we kind of know that commonly that people, you know, access their credit for to get loans. But beyond loans, it's it's the loan, but it's also approval and the rate you're going to get on a loan. Um, credit also gives you access or denial to things like your employment. It can impact the insurance rate you're going to pay on car insurance. It can also impact um, things like, um, you know, like I said, home mortgage, things like that. Um, and a lot of times it, it can impact, you know, approval for things like utilities. The thing about credit that we've seen today is in some instances, especially when you look at employment, mm -hmm. things like that, it could be the deal breaker. So if you and I are interviewing for a job and aside from your male and female, all other things were 100% equal, and our credit scores were the final straw, your score and my score could be the determining factor. Now, that's not a guarantee, but that's one thing that you have to consider. I always tell people, people look at your credit to make decisions about you who may or may not know you. What do you want them to know? And see, that's scary. <laughs> that I can imagine for a lot of people that there's this thing that can have such a big impact on my life and I don't totally understand it. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about like kind of the the mysterious formula that makes up credit. Um, so there's two, first let's talk about this. There's two elements to when we deal with credit. We talk about the credit report and the credit score. Mm -hmm. And if I had to break it down as simply as possible, let's think about your credit report as your report card, like when mm -hmm. you were in grade school. Your report card, it had some letter stuff on it, but narrative on how you were performing. Okay. Like, likewise, your credit report includes personal identifying information, financial information, employment information, that in essence helps to get an idea of how you perform, right? Mm. You take that and it's a report. There are three reports, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. Those are the three main reporting bureaus. And that's the report. So if you think about the report as your report card, the credit score is like the GPA. Mm. And it's just like a GPA in school, the higher the better. Um, the most commonly used credit score is by the Fair Isis Corporation, FICO score. Um, but there are some other scoring models out there, but that's the most commonly used one. And that score um, is a combination of, again, how you pay your bills, you pay on time, the type of debt you have, how long you've had the debt, and how you handle that debt. They have a magical formula that goes into all that, and it outputs a number based on what's on the report. So like I said, just like a report card and mm -hmm. GPA, information input, score, output. And like I said, the most important thing to know about that is, do you pay your bills on time, and as you agreed in your terms, at least the minimums, mm -hmm. um, and then how much are you do you have available to you, and how much are you actually using? So, like in the case of a credit card, for example, um, if you have a thousand dollar limit on a credit card and you're spending three hundred dollars on it, or you you know you charge three hundred dollars on it, or maybe you can charge five hundred, but you pay it mm -hmm. back down to three hundred, you're using thirty percent of that capacity because you're using three hundred out of a thousand dollars. Okay, people with the best scores maintain either no value you know they pay their card to use them you have to have activity because credit mm -hmm. history is impact they use them but they pay them back down to no more than 30 percent of their credit card 
of, excuse me, their utilization. That's called your utilization. So it's important um, when it comes to like improving or maintaining scores that you're paying on time. You're not maxing your cards or maxing your loans out. Um, and that you're staying on top of credit and managing your debt, that and keeping it affordable, so you can stay mm -hmm. on top of those payments. But yeah, it is a mysterious thing, right? And it does have impact. So I know one question one of my friends asked before. Um, he's he's real nervous about borrowing. He doesn't even have a credit card. He deals mostly in cash. Does he have a credit score? Is it bad? Should he worry about that? Sure. So I will tell you this. Like I said, thirty five percent of your score is your credit, your payment history. So if you don't have a history. There's no, there's nothing to calculate that portion of your score. So I don't know if he has, if he has no uh, credit, he may not have um, a score or he may not have a good score. So how credit scores work, when you turn 18 and a half, so six months after you turn 18, you are usually assigned a score. Hmm. Um, I always tell students that score is somewhere around C average. Don't know enough about you to give you an A, but it's not fair to just completely fail you, right? Okay. So you come in somewhere around the uh, 500 to 600 range. And what you do from there can either drop that score or grow that score. Um, you can do things like get a small credit card, mm. uh, charge something like a tank of gas or grocery, something you were gonna already pay for in cash, Keep have the cash available, get the bill because you want the billing cycle to run and pay it off each month just to build that history and that activity. So I would, I would tell your, you know, your friend, um, if he's concerned that he's going to need credit at some point, mm -hmm. he wants to practice using it because the activity and the history he builds is what's going to build the score for him. The way he can check to find out if and what his score is, um, there's two things. You can check your credit report at annualcreditreport.com. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually check your credit score. There's a couple of ways. MyFICO.com is like the official score because that's FICO. That's the company that creates the score that's most commonly used. Um, there are a couple of companies out there that will provide the score. I think, uh, oh, I can't think of my one right now. Quizzle.com provides two of the scores, the FICO score. The other thing, a lot of times people ask me about Credit Karma. Um, Credit Karma is, and there's other businesses out there, they are a good monitoring place where you can monitor what your score and your activity might be. The one thing to note about Credit Karma is they're one of the companies that uses a different scoring model than the FICO score. Oh, really? So they use what's called a Vantage 3.0 score. Um, you know, it's not about which one's good or bad. FICO is the more commonly used score. So for monitoring, that's good. But we always tell people, keep in mind your uh, credit karma score could be different than what we as your financial institution see when you come in to apply for a loan. So they, we just tell people to keep that in mind. But from the standpoint of monitoring your activity, that's another place you can check um, to just get your general idea of activity for free. So you don't really so, just have one credit score then? No, so you actually have three credit scores um, because you just, and each score is matched to your credit report. So Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax each have a score based on the information that's reported in and out of your credit reports. Yeah. Okay. So if I am starting to build up my, my credit, um, what are some tips for just, you know, maintaining that, paying off my debts? Sure. So like I said, um, the main thing is um, if you're trying to build credit, is to start small. Um, I always tell people practice first, right? Have a budget um, first so you know how much money you have available to even allocate toward monthly uh, credit or debt payments. Start small with something like a secure or first-time user credit cards. Those are credit cards that usually come at a lower balance um, and the secure card you actually will put some cash toward it in case you don't pay it on time but it's a way to build credit because one thing we like to tell new borrowers or new you know new money managers your debit card and your checking account isn't doing anything for your credit even though your debit card has mm. a little visa or a master you know a little emblem on it those aren't credit builders utility bills are not credit builders today they we don't know where they're headed in the future but today those things aren't credit builders they can only be credit uh, herders if you do something wrong with them mm. but right now they're not credit builders so you need something like a credit card maybe you co your parents co-sign with you on an auto loan or a person or a personal loan which is a loan that has you know so many payments over a period of time and it's gone those are ways to build healthy credit activity um, so you can do that 
And if you have a small balance credit card and you've been paying on time and doing well with it over time, you could inc request an increase on it. Don't use more, but you could request an increase because that shows that capacity increase. So mm -hmm. now if I'm using 100 out of $500, you know, that's what, 25, 20% of my capacity. If now I increase, get an increase to a $1,000 limit, now my, I'm only using 10% of that capacity. And that's that, that utilization and That's that utilization about. rate that we're talking about. That's another way to do it. Um, now, some entities like us we aren't going to just give you an increase without checking your score. You have to apply for that. Other places will automatically give you an increase. Um, we're careful about that because, again, that goes into that whole not giving you debt that you can or can't so afford. So you could get yourself in trouble even if they approve you for it. Yeah, because you if you use it and you really couldn't afford to, that could be a challenge. But if you know how to manage it, if you've practiced managing it, that's one way. Um, so those are just a couple ways to build your credit. Um, the one thing I always tell people about student loans, because a lot of times students will say, well, I'm building my credit because I have a student loan. And I'll ask them, like, is it in deferment? Which means you're not making active payments on it at that time. And there's, you know, if they say yes, your student loan in deferment doesn't hurt you or help you. Because it, again, goes back to payment history. So any loan in deferment doesn't have payment history. And so it's not necessarily hurting you because it's not showing up as, you know, a pain point that you're not paying it. It's not negative, but you're not also not showing any activity. So that's something to keep in mind. And we and I actually think we can loop back around the student loans here uh, shortly. If you want to pay off debt, so that was building credit, or you want to improve your credit by paying off debt, there's a couple things you can do. Um, first thing is to be clear about what debt you have. Um, you, again, you can check annualcreditreport.com. That is the federally hosted and approved website for pulling your credit report. Figure out how much you owe, who you owe, uh, how much interest you're paying for what you owe, and what your minimum balances are that are due. And I actually encourage you to write that down. Do what I call debt inventory. Who do I owe, meaning what company? How much do I owe them? What's the minimum balance due every month? And how much interest am I paying for, for that loan? After you know that, with your budget, prioritize repayment and put any extra money you have on one balance, on one loan. Pay the minimum on all the rest. Now, I recommend what's called the snowball method. Hmm. Have you guys heard of the snowball method? So the snowball method is when you actually pay the smallest balance um, loan that you have first, pay extra on that one and make minimum payments on all your others. And then once you pay off that, you roll that payment plus any extra into your second payment and then into your third. But this snowball method does start with the lowest balance. Some people prefer what's called the stack method, which is the paying off your highest interest rate first because of the cost of the debt. Um, you know, people always ask me which one's better. I prefer snowball because I like to see progress quickly and working with that lower balance first um, it feels like I'm getting ahead a little more quickly. Some people that are bottom line dollars people and feel like I'm gonna save more in the end to do it, We'll do the stack method. And, and again, you have to do what works for you and what you're going to stick to. But either way, focus on one first. That's the main key in that. Don't put, a lot of times people put a little bit on everything and nothing really moves. So I just always recommend putting a lot, you know, any extra on one bill so you can really see it go away more quickly and then rolling those extra payments um, one by one into the next bill. And that's called getting that snowball effect or really demolishing that debt. So when you do that and show that active history, that will start to improve your score as your capacities change. Right. But the main thing is, even if you're not doing, if you can't afford right now to make extra payments or to um, really, you know, snowball or knock out that debt, just make sure you're paying on time. That's the first step. Get all your bills current and on time, and that's a huge difference maker. Hey guys, I've been talking a lot and I want to remind you all to continue to chime in. Uh, hopefully you're checking, in, uh, checking out what we're talking about today, but feel free to ask your questions as well. We're not only here to uh, share what we've heard um, outside of here, but we also want to chat with you all and hear from you as well. So let me know what you're thinking out there and what questions you might have, okay? So yeah, so that's, that's debt. Um, there's, you know, debt is uh, its own world. There's so many different things that you can do. The main thing too is get help if you need it. Um, I can't stress that enough. Um, like I said, I mentioned earlier in the stream, we do have resources here at the credit union for people that can sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and actually walk through a uh, budget. Um, they can do a debt management plan with you. They can give you tips on things to improve your credit. You know, maybe what solutions or, and products might help you build your credit. Um, and so I just encourage people to do that. Come to your financial institution first. Don't go to the stores. 
because mm. they're in the business of making money first. Um, and then they just happen to have products, you know, credit cards and things like that to help you with that. Financial institutions, well, some are in the business. We're, we all have to live, we all, but we're in the business of helping you reach your goals. And so our partners are really committed to that. That's just my little soapbox. They really are committed to helping you figure out the best option. So you may come in and tell us you want a credit card because you want to build your credit. They may see your portfolio or your, you know, your credit report and decide and make a recommendation that there's another option or a better way for you to do it. So just keep that in mind, even if you're thinking about like consolidating debt having that goal in mind when you come in, we can help you walk through that process. Yeah. Yeah, that's really helpful. We're, we're getting a few comments, people just saying how much they appreciate this information. Oh, awesome, awesome. Well, so uh, did, did you want to circle back to student loans again? Because I know for a lot of folks getting started, that that's kind of top of mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So student loans, oh man. Um, student loans are a monster. But again, student loans are viewed as loans that are there to help us to achieve a goal. The issue with student loans is that a lot of times the overborrowing happens. Um, and whether that's because it's just the cost of you know college is what it is and I have to pay, you know, that's what I have to do to take care of it. So first I want to talk about um, how to make sure that if you're going to get a student loan that you're getting the best deal when you do or you're you know, you're doing the best thing for yourself. We always take with our student loan partner what's called the free cheap gap approach. Mm -hmm. So if you need to get a student loan, before you ever go out and get a, a like a private loan, you wanna do one thing, you wanna exhaust your free options. Um, free options are grants and scholarship money and gifts for mom and dad and grandma and grandpa. So, always so, so, <laughs> so, when, so when you say free. Free right? money meaning you don't have to pay it back. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so that's what I mean by free. Free money meaning it's not a loan, you don't have to pay it back, it's just money that whether it's through gifts or scholarships or grants that you're given for whatever reason you applied for it, but you don't have to pay it back. So that's what we call free money. And I know a lot of people actually leave that on the table. I mean, I remember back in my college, professors would complain, you guys gotta uh, apply for these. You have to apply. <laughs> There's so many scholarships out there. Um, you know, if you have a high school student, check, have them check with their counselor. There's usually a whole book of scholarships. There are apps out there that will help you put your profile in and it'll tell you the type of scholarships you might be eligible to apply for. I always tell people don't spend a lot of money applying for scholarships because again, you shouldn't spend a lot of money to get free money. But mm -hmm. there are apps out there and there are resources out there um, that will help with that. I can't necessarily endorse one or the other, but there are things out there. My point is to ask questions. Have your student ask the counselors, how can I find free money? Libraries have whole uh, shelves and shelves of how to apply for scholarships. If they don't have a job, their job should be applying for scholarships, one a week. So there's first tip. <laughs> look for the free money. Second tip is gonna be, after that, look for what we call the cheap money. So um, you wanna fill out your FAFSA, your free application for federal student aid. That gives you access a lot of times to scholarships and grants, but also government loans. Today, federal government loans are still the cheaper loans that are out there, okay? We don't know if that's gonna be forever, but they still come in, in most cases, cheaper than a private student loan. So you wanna apply for it. A lot of times people will say, you know, I make too much money, my parents make too much money, we're not gonna qualify. You're going to qualify for a federal loan. Whether it's subsidized, meaning they'll pay the interest for you while you're in school, or unsubsidized, meaning the interest is gonna grow while you're in there, that's gonna be a decision that's gonna be made based on income and need and those kind of things. But you're gonna apply, you're gonna, um, as long as you didn't default on previous student loan, you will be approved for a student loan. <laughs> so the myth that you make too much money to be approved for something when you fill out the FAFSA is, is indeed a myth. So everyone has to fill out the FAFSA because a lot of times that's how you even qualify for certain scholarships, even if they aren't federal ones. So fill out the FAFSA, see what cheap money you apply for, which means loans you have to pay back, but at a cheaper interest rate. And then finally, if you have a gap to fill, that's when you wanna start exploring things like, do I need a private student loan? Do I need a credit card? Um, do I, you know, some people will do HELOCs. I always tell people this, be mindful of the type of interest rate you're gonna pay for private debt, whose name is on the private debt. If your child, if it's your child you're sending to school, your child should have some skin in the game. They should be co-applicant with you on those student loans. Let them be a part of the process. It is their education. And the last time we calculated it, they will have a longer time to pay back the student loan than you will as a parent. They're younger than you, okay? So that's, the, that's, that's on the end of acquiring the debt. When it goes into repayment, it's really important to consider a couple of things. Um, 
if you're going to defer, meaning you're going to not pay the student loan while you're in school, can you still pay, make interest payments or some type of payment toward the interest? Many loans are what I mentioned are unsubsidized, meaning even if they're in deferment, like you're not actively paying them while you're in school, you're still accruing the interest rate. Whatever your interest rate is, you're still accruing that interest on the loan. What happens with student loans when they come out of deferment or they come out of forbearance, say you forbear, meaning same thing as deferment, but you did it outside of school. You got approved for forbearance. When they come out of that break from payment, they do what's called capitalizing. So for example, you have a $10,000 student loan and it, occur, it accrued, accrued $2,000 in interest over the time that it was in deferment. You now have a $12,000 student loan. Mm -hmm. You don't have a $10,000 loan with $2,000 of uh, interest. You now have a new $12,000 loan with capitalization that now is going to get charged interest on top of the $12,000 instead of the $10,000 and $2,000. So you, in essence, are paying interest on top of it and you're you know, lengthening the time of your loan in many cases. And so just by making interest payments in deferment, that can save you thousands of dollars. Um, so you wanna look at that if you can. But if you can't, you can't. But if you can, you want to. The other thing about student loans, because of that whole capitalization thing, is even if you can't pay the full, you know, the amount that's being proposed to you as you get ready to go into repayment, communicate with the lenders about repayment options. What other options are out there? There are so many different repayment, income-based, graduated. There's different things out there that you can consider. The most important thing is to communicate with the lender to see what options you have to make repayment affordable for you until you get to a place where you can really buckle down and chunk down mm -hmm. on it. Because again, you want to, when it's time to go active into repayment, you want to be repaying those loans. You don't want to forbear or defer in, if you don't have to. Now, there are times when we have to do that. And like I said, especially when students are in school and not making income, that's not uncommon. More people will defer than not. But especially when you're in that repayment standpoint, you want to try to make it affordable and make those payments so that you're not dealing with that capitalization that I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's student loans. The other tip is try not to borrow more than what you're going to make in your first year of your career oriented job. So if, if you have, you know, research the type of work you want to do, find out how much you might make, you know, on average it's twenty to $35,000. Try not to take on more than twenty to $35,000 over the whole course of your college experience, because you ha you don't want to you don't want to exceed the amount of time you're paying that back throughout the whole. You don't want that to be the whole length of your career. You're paying back what you're now working. You know what you've earned to work for. So that's one little general rule of thumb that some people share. You know, don't take on more debt than you could than you make in the first year outside of college. So that's not a lot of debt. That's that's a small number, and that's not what most people are doing. On average, I think we're over sixty between sixty and seventy thousand. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, just talking to some <laughs> of my friends, especially some degree programs, that that'd be a pretty optimistic plan, honestly. It is. It is. I mean, that rec that's going to require that would require a lot of forward planning, um, and that's and even in some cases, even with that, that's with the cost of education rising as it is, that's still pretty optimistic. But I guess your point is like that shouldn't be your only vehicle. Like, yes, the cost is more than that, but start with your free money, start exactly. with your cheap Exactly, and that's why I kind of started with that first, is to really think differently about how we're gonna pay for college in the first place. Hey, do you go to a two-year you know, uh, community college and then transfer into a four-year program? We're seeing that as a very common way for people to knock out their general education classes, save a lot of money, and not incur the debt to go to school. You know, that's become a very common way for students to pay for and go to school without the debt. And so it is really about looking differently at how your college uh, career and career path is going to look for you. And then thinking about that ahead of time, even, you know, when you're evaluating what schools you're going to choose. So, yeah, so that, that's kind of student loan at a glance. Uh, yeah. We covered a lot. I mean, we've, we've talked about smart planning, saving better, spending better, and how all these connect. But I know there's a rising fear out there, too. I might be doing everything right. What about frauds? What about people coming oh, after yeah. me? You know what? There is a rising fear. And I, we, we do a fraud seminar, and I always tell people at the beginning, I say, okay, guys, I'm going to tell you three things. Big Brother is watching. Big Brother knows but that doesn't mean you have to walk in fear. The reality is, I think the blessing and curse of technology is upon us. You know, we are in a wonderful technological age. Things are moving rapidly. 
um, and we're able to do a lot because of that. But because of that, we also are in an age of access. And so we're seeing a lot of fraud due to more access. And we're also seeing a lot of fraud because of the fast pace that people are moving in. I go back to my microwave. Everybody's in a microwave mentality. Everything's mm. quick, fast, now I want it in a hurry. I don't want to think about it. I don't really want to work for it. Unfortunately, instead of what I call the crock pot mentality, which is slow, thoughtful, easy, give it time. <laughs> it'll When it comes out, it'll be great. Because we're in this microwave mentality, a lot of times, we're seeing fraud, um, not because it's going to happen, but we're missing it because we're not paying attention to it. Mm -hmm. And so if we would take the pause, I think that's the thing. Because like I said, my, my, I always share with big brothers watching, things are happening. Um, we see breaches every day, every other day, meaning, you know, companies are being breached, information is being breached. But I always tell people a lot of the main breaching is going on, on your, in your own doing, you know, whether that's uh, sharing information through social avenues whether that's click here and you click through on an email um, to, to click to something and it may have been a spooked website, a fake website, that now you've entered a, opened a portal to share your information. Not managing or monitoring your um, checking accounts and, and savings accounts to see small transactions that you may not have done. Those are ways where we're personally missing it um, in some of the different fraud that's happening. So let me back up a little bit. First, mm -hmm. I guess I could share a couple of fraud trends we're seeing from a financial okay. standpoint. Um, interestingly, check fraud is still uh, common, uh, meaning people's check theft. People are still stealing checks and uh, check washing, kind of washing off. And, the and this is this is across the board. Across the board, not just at Right Pack Credit Union. This is across the board. Um, and then um, we're still we're actually seeing check theft out of mailboxes again. <laughs> so tax season, that was a fraud alert we got at the credit union. So it's not all high tech. So it's not all high tech. So that's the other thing I will note. Um, there are still tr traditional forms of fraud, dumpster diving. Those things still happen. But yeah, people are stealing checks out of, of the mail. Um, people ask us a lot of times about mobile deposit. Is, is check theft possible through mobile deposit? Well, the thing to know, know about check theft or, or mobile deposit is your check still goes through the same system it would go through if you walked into the member center to cash a check. It's just it takes the picture and, and funnels it digitally. Um, so people are attempting it, yes, but it's not something that's just an easy thing to do. You can't just write a check, deposit it, and ta-da, it's mm. you know it just works because it is still going through the authentication system that it would go to if you physically did it. So when I say check fraud, I'm not so much talking about that, but we have to be vigilant there too. We also see a lot of scams happening. Um, we see scams, sweetheart scams, where people try to create familiarity with you and convince you to send them money or do something on their cash a check on their behalf and send a portion back. We're seeing what's called phishing and smishing scams. Scams coming online or over the phone or over text message, seeming like a familiar source. So maybe they, you know, mimic Right Pack Credit Union or a familiar organization and asking you for your personal information. That's actually been something that I've seen in our comments before where, um, you know, they'll say, oh, just don't answer a message from someone you don't know. But the problem is it, it might look like it, someone you know now. Yeah. So one thing I, t and that's true, and that's the challenge in that, right? The, a lot of what we're seeing with that, the scams are people are mimicking familiar faces or familiar names. We've even seen elder fraud, elder scams on the phone where someone calls their uh, a old elderly person in a panic. Grandma, it's me. The grandmother says, Jimmy? Yeah, it's Jimmy. I haven't heard of you in a while. They use the information to engage in conversation, and now I've convinced you that I'm me, and you send me a check, or you do, you know, wire me money, whatever it is. So a lot of times we are, the challenge with scams is that it is using familiar faces, familiar organizations, people you do business with to do uh, fraudulent activity. The thing I always tell people with that, whether it's email, phone, text, whatever it is, don't respond directly to it. If you think it might be accurate, call it directly on your own. Mm. So if it is a phone call, get off the phone with them, even if you, you know, you've answered. Get off the phone and call the, the, you know, the main 800, whatever the main customer service line is for that entity. If it's a text, don't reply to the text. It, it, whatever they said they were related to, go research it on your own separate from it so it's disconnected from that. Um, if it is an email, don't click through if you think it's accurate. So we see like PayPal scams all the mm -hmm. time. Don't click through the PayPal link. Go to PayPal.com and log in on your own. If there's a true alert there, it will it will be there. Um, I guess that's something too to note for us for common practice. Right Path's not going to reach out to you to ask you for information. 
that we already know, first of all. Then that's, that could be best practice among most entities. They're not going to ask you things they already know. Um, they shouldn't be, at least. Um, the other thing about it, now, if you call them and they have to verify your identity, yes, they have to take you through that verification. But you should not get reached out to to ask you about account information that the organization you have a relationship with should already have. Likewise, if it's a family member, they should not be asking you for things that they already can access in other ways. So the main thing is like to just pause and think in that instance. Um, and if you think it may be valid, go to the source directly on your own and research it that way. That's a good way to not open the portal and line of communication. We always say, don't, you know, if there's phishing, don't take the bait. <laughs> so um, ftc.gov is a really good place to go to get trend, you can actually get fraud alerts, scam alerts as a consumer to stay up on some of that stuff. And you can also report fraud there. That's the other thing. If you are impacted by fraud, don't just let it go. If you see things on your account that don't look right, report it to us. We can help you take care of it or report it to the institution that was impacted, you know, impacted. But if you see fraud happening on a large scale, report it. By reporting, you're helping find trends and you may be helping catch the criminals in the in the so, I mean, that, that's kind of fraud at a glance. We are seeing several things happen. Like I said, things are gonna probably continue to happen just because we're in this technological quick world. We have that access, which is good, but we have to be vigilant in that access. So just be vigilant, monitor your accounts, check your credit report, report activities, report suspicious activity, and don't take the bait when you're getting those calls. Research it on your own. Well, thank you so much, Ivy. You've covered so so much information and it's, it's interesting because at the front of it, it, it's, it doesn't sound that hard. Like overall, like money management doesn't sound as hard it as is. it actually is. <laughs> it's the doing part, right? Oh, it, it can be hard, um, but we make it hard. I think if I could do anything, it'd be just to say chunk it out in small steps. Um, because it can be hard if you, it can be, oh, it, it's not even so much it can be hard, it can be overwhelming. We didn't even talk about retirement, but we can't forget about planning for tomorrow, you know. But it is about chunking it into small, digestible steps and doing a little bit at a time. I actually have this um, that I share in our seminars, and it's a spend, save, borrow, plan checklist. And it's just some, like, top tips, things that we recommend that you do all the time. But I always tell people, don't try to go home and do the whole list at once. Take one category or take two or three things from a category because you can overwhelm yourself into um, paralysis. Mm -hmm. and, not, and then you just say, forget it and don't do it. You know, so take small steps because it can be not hard but overwhelming. It can be mm. overwhelming to try to do it all at one time. I think that's a really good point. Yeah. You know, I've, I've been talking about this for nine years, and I will tell you there are some days it still all overwhelms me when I go home and do it for myself. <laughs> so <laughs> you just have to step back, back into it and take small chunks at a time. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, thank you everyone for uh, spending some time with us. This was a quick flyby. I mean, we have wow, a lot of it. We have, it's been an hour already. <laughs> oh and gosh. yeah, so we're about out of time, but there are a lot of other resources people can use if they yeah. want to dig deeper. Yeah. So yeah, a um, couple of different things. At the Credit Union, we're excited because we do this all year round. Our goal is not this. We're, we may be doing this more, depending on how you like it. But um, we have resources on our website, wpcu.coop backslash education. We can definitely post that out there. Go out there to our education center. There are online modules, um, interactive modules you can watch, tips out there. We have a fraud section on our website. We do complimentary seminars um, throughout the year that our event calendar is out on that website. I mentioned GreenPath. That's our certified one-on-one -on -one counseling partner. You can find information about them out there on that website. Um, and then... You know, there are so many resources out there outside of the credit union. If you're a credit union member, you have a tool online on once you log into online banking, online money management, where you can create budgets, track your spending, view your transactions, create savings goals, and actually create automatic transactions. All of that's out there. Um, so just take some time and, and explore is my main thing. Um, and again, chunk a little bit at a time so you don't para uh, go into paralysis when you do it. But yeah, those things are out there. And then we're here as a resource to help and when it comes to the tools and products that might be able to guide you on your journey. All right. Yeah. Well, well, thank you again. If, if you guys have questions, feel free to post them in the comments below or to reach out to us uh, through our, our phone line or through the website. Yeah. Thanks, guys. This was great. Have a good afternoon.